So uh, my name is Samira and I'm the coordinator for the Quest Ontario Caucus. Just a quick background around Quest and Quest Ontario before we get going. So Quest conducts research, engagement and advocacy to advance smart energy communities across Canada. You can find out all you need to know about smart energy communities and how they work by going to questcanada.org. The Ontario Caucus of Quest is one of eight provincial and regional caucuses across Canada. In Ontario, we have over 250 highly engaged caucus members, representing various sectors including municipal and provincial government, utilities and energy providers, suppliers, NGOs, and much more. Our caucus has several working groups and meets quarterly to share progress, collaborate, and network. If you're not on the Quest Ontario mailing list, please uh, feel free to email me after the webinar and I'll make sure that you're added so that you can stay current on Quest Ontario events such as these and uh, Quest Ontario updates. I'd also like to highlight that Quest will be hosting its annual conference in Toronto this year titled Quest 2015, Getting Smart About Energy in Our Community. The conference um, one second. <laughs> the conference brings together stakeholders from various sectors, including municipal and provincial governments, utility, industry, consultants, NGO, academic, and much more, and hosts a discussion around the most pressing and time related to energy, including energy planning, technology, energy delivery, energy policy, all of the focus on advancing smart energy. All of the focus on advancing smart energy. I'm just hearing some uh, a bit of I'm just hearing some echoing here. Echoing here. All right, hopefully that's better. Okay, so along with attending the conference, there are various sponsorship and exhibiting opportunities. Um, and I'd like to announce today that Quest is offering a summertime discount on tickets, and you can, for a limited time, uh, receive 20% off of the price of registration. So welcome to the second of a five-part summer webinar series pr produced by the Quest Ontario Caucus. Uh, this webinar series was developed with the guidance of the Quest Ontario Municipal Working Group, which is a group of approximately 25 municipalities that are engaged in community energy planning activities. Information on the remainder of the webinars is available at questcanada.org slash Ontario, and you can just scroll down to the bottom of the page uh, under New with Quest Ontario. So note that this webinar will be recorded and will be made available online. Today's session is called Stimulating the Electric Vehicle Market in Ontario. And I'd like to take a moment to thank Josh uh, Tverenti uh, at Plug and Drive for his role in the development of the program today. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce our guest speakers. Uh, so first we have Josh Tverenti, and sorry for mispronouncing your name just now. He is the Director of Operations with uh, Plug and Drive. We have Shuvo Chowdhury, a Smart Grid Engineer with PowerStream. And finally, we have Jennifer Wong, who is a Sustainability Services Coordinator with the City of Markham. So before we get started, just a couple of administrative points to make. So first is uh, questions will only be addressed after each speaker has made his or her presentation. If you have a question, you can type it into the chat box at any time, uh, but know that they will only be addressed after the speaker has finished. Second is I will be moderating the questions. So if you have one, please type it clearly into the chat box and I will pose it to the speaker. We'll try to get through as many questions as we can, but if there are any outstanding ones, I encourage you to follow up with the speakers directly. So Josh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to you. You ready? You ready, Josh? Yeah, hello. All right, great. Go ahead. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, as Samira said, my name is Josh Twintarney, and I work at Plug and Drive. We're a nonprofit that's been working for the past four years to promote electric vehicle adoption in Ontario, uh, educating consumers, working with utility companies, and uh, trying to just in general promote their adoption. So I'm just going to give a little bit overview of uh, of why electric vehicles are a really great opportunity for Ontario. Uh, the transportation sector is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the province. It accounts for 34% of total uh, emissions right now. And the Canadian Medical Association has estimated that uh, air, the cost of air pollution could be as high as $118 billion by 2031. Here's just a little breakdown that shows uh, where the emissions are all coming from. And as you can see, more than half of the transportation emissions are from road vehicles. 
electric vehicles have the advantage of taking advantage of taking advantage of Ontario's low emitting electricity, which is in surplus at night. And that means that we can lower emissions from between 57 to about 96 percent compared to a, a comparable gas vehicle. Also, consumers can save greatly between 67 to 90 percent on fuel costs compared to, to gas. And all of that electricity is locally made, so it's a stimulus to the local economy. A lot of the work we do at Plug and Drive is uh, researching the different aspects of the vehicles, the life cycle emissions, and the cost to drive for consumers. And this chart just shows you uh, each of the different electric vehicle models available, as well as their uh, comparable emissions to drive 100 kilometers compared to uh, different gas vehicles. And all this information is available on our website. And of course, the cost to drive is a very compelling case for, uh, for drivers as well. The first electric vehicle was sold in July of 2011. And since then, there's been about 12,600 sold. And vehicle sales have been increasing quite steadily. There's just a different look at it. Uh, there are peaks and valleys that have occurred with different gas prices and different economic incentives that have come on board. But in general, the the, the trend has been positive and sales have been increasing greatly. Currently there are about 4,000 electric cars, both 100% electric battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids which use a combination of gas and electric. Uh, the most popular cars are the Chevy Volt, the Tesla Model S and the Nissan Leaf currently. But more models are coming on board every couple of months and uh, we're excited to see what comes around. This chart here just shows uh, the top 25 municipalities for EV adoption according to information from the Ministry of Transportation. And the map is just uh, shows concentric zones of where the vehicles are located. It's pretty much in line with the population. Uh, we haven't seen any trends that show any areas in higher adoption, but it's very positive to see that they're all located across the province. Now I just wanted to spend a moment to kind of differentiate between the two types of electric vehicles. There are plug-in hybrid electric vehicles which use a combination of gas and electricity to complete their trip and the size of the battery determines how far their electric range is versus when the gas generator kicks in. Battery electric vehicles or BEVs are 100% electric. And this chart just shows the, the breakdown of which vehicles are currently on the market and whether they're uh, use some combination of gas or fully electric. Now it's important to understand that the majority of charging will happen at home where it's convenient for consumers and so we've been working with many of Ontario's utilities to uh, promote electric vehicle adoption and we've actually started a web store at chargemycar.ca where we sell Canada's largest selection of charging stations and we help answer consumer questions and help them through the process of choosing, buying and installing a charging station. And we're working with utilities to better understand their needs. Uh, through this research, we've, we've been able to help work through some major barriers such as uh, installing vehicle charging stations in condominiums and uh, hope to soon address on-street parking as well as other major barriers. A lack of awareness remains one of the key aspects that, that prohibits people from purchasing electric vehicles. Uh, so we've been on an EV road show educating consumers for the past four years and we've delivered more than 3,500 test drives at more than 200 events. Uh, the big show that we have coming up uh, on August 1st, we'll be in Kingston doing test drives at the Princess Promenade Festival. And on September 24th in Toronto, we're having our fourth annual EV day where we bring out all the cars and have test drives. But in general, uh, it, it remains a key barrier. So we, we encourage the utilities and municipalities to, uh, to invite us to their events and we can provide test drives locally. Another barrier is the availability of charging stations. There are more than 600 uh, level two charging stations. These are uh, stations that typically 
take three to eight hours to charge at and would be the same as you find at your home. But these businesses across Ontario have been installing them and that's very positive. But it doesn't help for longer trips. For longer trips you need a faster charger which we call a, a fast charger or DC fast charger and those can charge a battery in 30 minutes to an hour depending on the model. And unfortunately as you can see from this map there's, uh, there's currently only five publicly available DC quick chargers in the province as well as the ones that have been installed by Tesla but those are only available for Tesla users. So the development of these fast chargers is really integral for the further development of the EV industry and to encourage provincial and interregional travel. And uh, PowerStream, which we'll hear about in a little bit, has taken an active role in installing um, these fast charging stations at their headquarters in Bonn and has partnered with Markham to install charger recently, which is quite exciting. We're also working to better understand consumers' habits with these vehicles. And we've started the EV Owners Club of Canada uh, to engage with the 12,000 plus uh, EV owners across Canada and to learn more about their experience. We're modeling our efforts after what's been done in California where they've done extensive work with the EV owners in that state to better understand uh, just their motivations for purchasing the vehicle even just basic demographic which is missing right now. So we encourage everyone to sign up for the Owners Club at pluginddrive.ca slash evownersclub and we are uh, actively engaging with them right now. Some of the interesting things that came out of the California study, uh, they found that 32% of EV owners already had photovoltaic systems installed on their home and a further 16% intended to in the future. And uh, from our conversations with the EV owners in Canada, we see a similar interest in, in developing the off-grid electricity system uh, in their own homes and progressing that further. So we hope to get more information soon on that and uh, hopefully we can progress that study. Just briefly about Plug and Drive, as I mentioned, we're a nonprofit that was formed in 2008 out of the Ontario Power Generation where my boss Kara Clareman started it as the VP of Sustainable Development. In 2011, she uh, created the independent organization of Plug and Drive and set up a board of directors with many CEOs of electricity companies across the, the province and they've been instrumental in help guiding our efforts. Um, our sponsors primarily have been the Ontario Power Generation, Power Workers Union, TD Bank and the Ministry of Transportation, but we've had many, many partners who have helped our efforts to succeed and to grow the EV industry. Uh, we mainly do education awareness, as I mentioned, but we also have been mapping the charging station across Canada and working to deploy that in different mediums. Our Charge My Car program helps connect utilities with EV owners and sell charging stations, and our EV Owners Club is progressing the information that way. As I mentioned, we are having EV Day at Young and Dundas Square on September 24th, and we invite everyone to take a drive or to invite us to your community where we can do a similar effort of bringing electric vehicles out. And there's just our contact information if anyone's interested in reaching out to us. Thank you, Josh. That was great. Um, I'd like to open it up now to the floor to see if there's any questions from our attendees. I'll give you a minute to, uh, to type your question into the chat box. Um, and while I'm doing so, I'm going to pass the controllers over to uh, Shilo. So again, if you have any questions at, the, at this point, please go ahead and uh, type it into the chat. So we have one question here. Are there provincial incentives for EVs in Ontario? Oh yes, I, I should have mentioned that a little earlier. There is a $8,500 rebate available for fully electric vehicles and up to $5,800 for, for most plug-in hybrids, as well as a uh, incentive of up to $1,000 off the cost to purchase and install a home charging station. Great, thanks, Josh. And businesses can are eligible for that as well. We have a, oh, we have a couple other questions here. 
Um, so the next one is, what do you think will be needed to spur the growth of DC fast chargers? That's a great question. There, right now we're kind of in an interesting place where the technology has evolved to allow for uh, multiple kinds of vehicles, both the European and the Japanese and North American vehicles, which use different standards to charge under the same unit. And so I believe that the development of that combination tar charging station has been one of the barriers to greater adoption. And now that that's more widely available and the costs are coming down, it should spur further development. However, the economic model is not clear right now given that there's not much information about how people will use it. So there needs to be some leadership. Uh, and I think PowerStream's model where they split the cost of installation uh, three ways between the town of Markham, PowerStream itself, and then Nissan Canada, each paying one third of the cost. I think that's an interesting model moving forward. In BC, the, the provincial government uh, provided a large incentive to install charging stations. And in uh, Quebec, they've done a similar effort. So I think it's a combination of, of different mediums, but we're still exploring what will work in Ontario. Excellent. Um, so we have a, a comment here um, that I will read out loud uh, from Tim Short from uh, Enbridge Gas Distribution. So the comment is, I can see the natural relationship between electric vehicle owners and homeowners with PV on their homes, on their homes' roofs. Uh, in Ontario, the vast majority of the PV installations are microfit. It would be interesting to monitor if the PV EV relationship changes as the province transitions from microfit to net solar metering, where some of the EV owners may wish to power their cars from the sun. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And hello, Tim. Um, from the owners that I've spoken to in Ontario, in, in Ontario, they when they've installed solar, it's been with a battery backup. So as opposed to going for the grid tie-in, which uh, can be a little more complicated, they've gone right to uh, storing the electricity and batteries and using it uh, to charge their car later on anyway. And, and that's been quite popular. There's, there's quite a few people who have gone that route. And some of the utilities are, are looking at ways to get more involved in those processes. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, so another question here. Given the extended charge times for L2 chargers, do they serve any real purpose in having them implemented in public, sla uh, public places for uh, intercity intermunicipal travel? Uh, great question. Uh, it's kind of a chicken and egg scenario right now. A lot of people are hesitant to install charging stations until they see more cars on the road. However, many own or potential owners are, are hesitant to purchase the vehicles until they have seen more public chargers on the road. So I would say yes, it is important to keep installing level two charging because especially at destinations such as workplaces or, or malls, restaurants, places where people can spend a little bit of time, they can still get a few extra kilometers added to their charge, which can make the big difference between getting home or not. Also, just as a security blanket, if you go a little further than you expected or you run into some traffic, it's always nice to have uh, a nice sprinkling of chargers across your, your trip to make sure that you, you're comfortable with your range. Okay, so I'm going to take two more questions and then we'll move on to our next presenter. Uh, so the one here is, will the province continue to allow EVs and the PHEVs uh, to drive in HOV lanes? Uh, and are there any other perks of EV ownership? Well, one of the perks of EV ownership is that the cars are all fantastic and the performance is really great. There's a reduced maintenance and things like that. Uh, with regards to the HOV lanes and the uh, Premier Wynn announcing that there could be tolls on some of the HOV lanes to allow for single occupants, it is our understanding that, yes, the green-plated electric vehicles will continue to be allowed to use them at no extra fee. And uh, that as far as we are aware, uh, will continue for the foreseeable future. We are looking at unlocking other benefits for green plate drivers and electric vehicles. And uh, that could be anything from uh, preferred parking to potentially discounts at some EV friendly establishments. It's, there's really a lot of opportunities out there, especially once there's 
uh, further charging developed and uh, businesses to develop further relationships with the EV ownership group. Interesting. And so, okay, so the last question here uh, refers to uh, obstacles in the condominium industry. So what are the obstacles for condominiums and what is being done to overcome them? Great question. So last year we partnered with the Canadian Condominium Institute and uh, the World Wildlife Foundation to develop a guide for EV owners who are interested in installing charging stations in condos. And that's available for download at plugandrive.ca slash condo. And uh, essentially, most of the buildings that have been built are not prepared for the requirements of EV charging. And the guide we prepared just helped EV owner or condo owners, condo managers, and property managers work through the logistic and legal considerations when looking to install a charger. Uh, one of the quick wins is to install a, a charger for public use in, uh, in an underutilized space such as a car wash bay or somewhere that's close to the electrical access and that can help buy time until there's uh, further interest in installing them. Also some condos have shown an interest in developing a or installing a main line through the parking lot as part of their uh, capital expenditures and just having each individual EV owner tap into that main line, which would greatly reduce the cost for everyone involved. Ultimately, it comes down to how much electricity capacity is in the building, and that will determine a lot of the extra costs that are required. Obviously, if, if there's not enough capacity, it, it's very difficult. So one of the considerations moving forward is uh, we're working to make recommendations for the building code that will allow for greater considerations in future buildings, both uh, multi-unit and single homes for the future installation of charging stations. Just if we can come up with some standards now, it'll, it'll help grow the industry moving forward. Okay, great, thanks Josh. So I'd like to turn it over now to Shubo Chaudhuri, who is a smart grid engineer with PowerStream. Um, so, Shubo, you've been unmuted. Please go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah, I hope you all can hear me here. Um, my name is Shubo Chaudhary. I'm uh, uh, an engineer with uh, PowerStream. I uh, work for the Smart Grid team. Um, before we actually start getting uh, getting started, I just wanted to comment on uh, one thing there. Uh, I think we had a question about how the PV relationship is going and what's going to happen. Uh, we actually are running business models right now, and what it shows is that the the uh, cost-effective thing to do is actually to sell as much power as you can into the grid when you have solar power. So you sell it at 14 cents during the day, and then if you want to charge your vehicle, um, you would buy the electricity back at 7 cents during the night. So uh, although intuitively you think that you know since you have the power at your site, you'd want to get the solar power directly into your vehicle. Uh, the way to make money is actually to sell that power and then to buy it back cheaply during the, the evening time. Uh, sorry, not even night time during the, the low peak period. Uh, anyway, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead with our presentation. Uh, I'll just give you a little background on who we are. Uh, Parstream is a municipally owned uh, local distribution company. We're owned uh, partially by the city of Vaughan, the city of Markham, and uh, the city of Barry. We service about 375,000. Customers, um, we have more than 500 uh, employees. We have about 1.4 billion dollars in assets. Um, we were Canada's greenest employee in 2005 and 2014, uh, and we are one of GTA's top employers uh, for the last couple of years. And I can personally assist, assist to that last one. Um, uh, Parsing has been a leader when it comes to a lot of the EV technology and uh, in front of you right now is a very, very brief timeline of what we've been doing. So, uh, you know, late 2010, uh, we decided that EVs were very much an uh, opportunity for us. Uh, we started working with uh, our partners on uh, EV trials. Uh, we actually bought uh, two of the first Nissan Leaf that came in uh, to Ontario. Uh, Along with that, we have installed some level two chargers. Uh, we partnered up with a Japanese company to test out the vehicle to grid technology. 
Um, you can see that we also partnered up with a number of universities in there. And uh, lately, we have been very focused on kind of level three charging. Uh, and I'll show you more on that as we go along. So uh, before we get into kind of the more, you know, leadership portion of it, uh, I'd just like to go through like a very basic primer on electric vehicle service, uh, supply equipment, so EVSE. And they, right now they come in three varieties. So you have the level one charger, the level two charger, and the level three or DC quick charger, DCQC or DCSC. Uh, the level one charger actually comes with your vehicle, and it's what you would use normally to charge your vehicle overnight. So it takes between uh, seven to 12 hours to charge in its own leaf, and you kind of connect it to your home at six o'clock in the evening, and then in the morning your car will be fully charged. Level two chargers, I think, uh, is, is something that uh, the previous presenter talked about quite a bit. And uh, that's uh, a unit that can either be installed in your home or in the public uh, space. And it can charge your uh, vehicle about, about twice as fast. Uh, but still, you know, that, that time is, you know, five hours, uh, three to five hours. So it's not exactly a quick charge. Uh, the level three or DC quick charger um, is a much larger unit. It's heavy, it's expensive, and it's something that nobody, I think, would install in their home. Uh, it requires the backing of, you know, either a municipality, uh, uh, a sponsor, or a power company to actually install one of these things. Uh, we have uh, two deployed so far, and I'll show you more on that later. Um, to go on with the primer, um, so an electric vehicle has a battery. Uh, most of that, oh, sorry, that battery is in uh, as a DC, so direct current. Uh, your home or any facility actually in North America is supplied by AC, uh, alternating current. So the the um, the way it works is that there is a piece of uh, equipment inside the vehicle that allows you to convert from AC to DC, so that your you can charge your battery from power that you get from a you know wall socket. Um, so that's kind of what this diagram illustrates. And this can be done using the first two types of chargers, level one and level two. And you can see that the level one charger kind of uh, tops out around two to three kilowatts, while the level two charger tops out around four to six kilowatts, something around that number. Uh, the, the real problem here is that that piece of machinery that converts AC to DC uh, is the limiting factor. So you know, car manufacturers don't necessarily want to put a very big piece in there because a heavy piece of, of equipment. Uh, so it doesn't matter how much power you have available at your site, you might be limited to your vehicle. So um, a, a Nissan Leaf, the newest ones, are have a six kilowatt rated uh, AC to DC converter, which means that you can only really convert six at a time. So six kilowatt is the maximum charging capacity of that vehicle. Now with the DC quick charger, this is not an issue because instead of going through this AC to DC conversion system, what we do is we charge the battery directly. So it's a, it's a parallel path. Uh, the connector is it's much bigger, it's heftier, and we can pump a lot more current into your system. Uh, so DC quick chargers, from what we see in the industry, start off at around 50 kilowatts, and uh, Tesla even has one that goes up to 123, uh, 20, sorry, 125. Kilowatts. Uh, these can charge your vehicle from five, uh, from 25 to 75 percent in about 30 minutes. Uh, vehicle charging is not linear, so just because it can do that in 30 minutes doesn't mean that it can, you know, charge your vehicle from 75 to 115 minutes. Uh, as the, as the battery becomes full, uh, the amount of power you can push into it uh, reduces. So um, uh, the relationship is not exactly linear. So when we talk about chargers, we usually talk about that 25 to 75 percent uh, uh, level. Now, what is in it for us uh, as a power stream? Um, well, uh, we see electric vehicle supply uh, equipment or electric vehicles in general as a disruptive technology. And although that that word has some negative connotations, what we mean by disruptive is that uh, this is something that will mean that we cannot go on doing the things that we do right now. So we cannot go on you know, simply planning the way we do right now. They will definitely affect the way we uh, plan our uh, you know, construction of subdivisions, plan our maintenance schedule, plan how we, uh, how we uh, get customers on board, all of that stuff. Uh, now, another reason is we want to help the municipalities within our service region and beyond our service region. 
to embrace the EV, EV revolution. We are big believers in, in EV technology and we'd like to see uh, more EVs on the road. We obviously want to serve our customers, but after all, we are a car company. So uh, a lot of our customers, uh, especially in Bonn, are trying to get, uh, are trying to buy electric vehicles uh, on our premises. We have a level three charger, and if you were to come by to our head office, you see that they usually line up to charge at that uh, particular charger. So uh, BMW i3, Nissan Leafs, uh, Mitsubishi Imis, uh uh, even Tesla's come around and, and charge at that facility throughout the day. Shuvo, and last but not least, this is actually Shuvo, a very, I'm sorry. just gonna sorry, I'm just gonna interrupt for a sec. Can you uh, just sorry. lean into yeah. your computer mic? Uh, that will make the sound a bit clearer. Thank you. Is this better? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so last but not least, as I was saying, uh, this is actually a very lucrative opportunity. Um, and, and Parshim would definitely like to be a part of it. Uh, and I'm sure it's, uh, you, uh, all the people representing Insta Valley would also like to be a part of it. Uh, so continuing with that, you know, what is it in what, what this has for us, um, in front of you here, you have a very typical kind of layout of how power is distributed to different homes. And you can see that, you know, we tap off the main line. Uh, we have a full bond transformer, and I'm sure that you've seen these on the pole, and there is a cylindrical thing. And each of these kind of service, and here it shows two homes, but usually each of these things service about six to eight homes on, on in our territory. Now, uh, normally your home consumes between four and eight kilowatts uh, worth of power at any one time, eight during a peak and four during base, even three sometimes. If you were to put a, um, a level two charger in your home, you would double that. And as you can imagine, if your neighbor and your neighbor and you decided to get these things, uh, our transformer would start becoming overloaded. And the thing is that right now, nothing says that you actually have to tell us that you put in some chargers, which means that we would only find out once the transformer is starting to degrade. Now, as a response on our side is we go and put up a bigger transformer. Uh, the bigger transformer obviously costs money. The replacement costs money. Uh, and when we do our rate calculations at the end of the year, we put this into it, and eventually everyone pays for it. So the, the rate of electricity price goes up. Uh, now, we don't want that to happen. Uh, so we want to do all kinds of things to prevent that scenario. We want to defer these assets. We want to make sure that we make these upgrades only when they're absolutely necessary. So one of the things we can do is uh, we can have you connect your electric vehicle charging system to our control room through the internet. So, uh, you know, a very buzzword nowadays is uh, the internet of things. Well, these are those things. So when you connect your systems to our system, what we can do is we can do staggered charging, we can do curtailed charging. So, you know, we can make sure that you charge first and your neighbor charge a second, and then tomorrow it's the other way around. Or we can say that, you know, both of you charge at 50%, instead of both of you charging at 100% for five hours, both of you charge at 50% for 10 hours. Uh, and that way we can prevent this overloading of our assets and uh, ensure that we don't have to rate base these things uh, the, year, the next year. Uh, the advantage for you, well, uh, there's probably going to be some kind of incentive if you do let us do this. So, you know, five bucks off your bill or something like that. We haven't fully made the business model yet, so don't hold me to those numbers. Um, now, in terms of concrete, what Parsim has been doing, uh, we have some level two chargers that are, and this is right, right at the front of our head office. These are free. Um, anyone can come over. They can charge their vehicles. Uh, we usually have people who come in for meetings from vendor offices or partner offices, and you know they might come in from uh, Barry or we actually have an office in Barry, so they might come in from Barry or Markham or Saga. They come in here. Um, they use these to charge for the three or four hours that they are in the office for a meeting. Uh, and then they head back. We also have a uh, BGG uh, system uh, at our office. Uh, so this is a this is a little blue box that you see there, and right beside it you can actually see two more level two chargers that are free to the public. The BGG system allows you to take power from a vehicle and put it back onto the grid. Uh, there are multiple use case scenarios for why you want to do this. This is not something you'd install in a home, but we can see it as something that would be installed in kind of fleet uh, scenarios where you know you might have like let's say FedEx trucks. 
you have eight or nine of them in your uh, in your parking lot, um, they're big, actually just giant batteries on wheels. So there are multiple uses for um, for having this battery there. You can use them as backup systems. You can use them to reduce the peak load. Uh, all kinds of other use case scenarios, which uh, you know, there are papers and papers on. Uh, and a sign that PowerStream has been leading this has been that um, California utilities, who are usually you know ahead in this sort of thing, actually contacted us to find out about our experiences with this VGG technology. And uh, based on that, they've actually ordered uh, a couple of these units for their own testing facilities. So here's actually the first kind of um, uh, PowerStream's first uh, level three charger that we deployed. And it's one of the uh, five, and actually now six, level three chargers that are available in Ontario. Uh, and you can see that that's right in front of our head office. Um, it has the, both of those charging heads that, that the previous presenter was speaking about, so you can charge either a BMW or a Nissan Leaf or a Mitsubishi or any of these uh, vehicles. Uh, the Tesla actually needs an adapter to do this, but uh, it's up on the Tesla owner's uh, head to actually get that adapter. Um, it's uh, free to the public. Uh, in the first six months, we had over 400 users, and we delivered about three megawatt uh, hours worth of uh, of electricity, and I think that comes out around uh, 15 or I think 20,000 kilometers worth of driven uh, kilometers, if you consider any uh, But I could be wrong; I, I haven't done the calculation. Uh, but, um, this is uh, actually the, the next uh, charger that uh, that we installed, and it went live on the 8th of July. Uh, and I think Jennifer will speak more about this as well. And uh, this is actually the model that we are looking into the, because. These level three chargers are expensive. Uh, we cannot expect any one entity to really roll these out. So we expect that a municipality, along with partnership with us and a sponsor like Nissan Canada, uh, would uh, would sponsor would uh, would initiate a project where we each uh, divide the cost of the unit like this. Uh, and that's what we did in this particular case. Uh, uh, it took very little time to install it. Only took about um, a month and a half or so to actually get it ground ready and everything. And the installation itself was only a one or two week job. Um, it actually looks like a fairly, a fairly uh, nice unit. Uh, in front of it, there are three spots for electric vehicles, and people actually come around and charge. And the the strange thing here is, and this is something that I think most of you realize as you get into this, is electric vehicle owners are actually very uh, informed. This unit hasn't even been officially launched yet, and we started getting people charging on it the day after it went live. So um, right now, uh, we get about four or five uses a day, and um, uh, we can see that that's been growing steadily over the last, uh, last couple of months. Uh, in addition to that, yeah, so I mean, uh, that's kind of a very brief overview of, uh, of what Parsim has been doing and uh, how Parsim has been kind of facilitating um, uh, level 2 charging. And here you can see our uh, Nissan Leafs that uh, we have in our own fleet. We kind of use them to go to meetings, uh, move around between offices. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for giving me this opportunity to kind of talk to you. Uh, if there are people in municipalities in, in, in this group, I'd like them to reach out to PowerStream because we are definitely uh, looking for partners to kind of put in new uh, DC fast charges. Uh, and with that, I'll open up to your questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Shivo. So uh, we have a lineup of questions here. And Shivo, just so you know, I've muted you while I asked the question because it appears to be a bit of echo when I'm when I'm speaking. So just wait till I'm done and then I'll, I'll unmute you. Um, so the first question here is, uh, does PowerStream offer any incentive programs to ensure L1 chargers are being properly used uh, primarily in off-peak hours? Uh, currently, we do not. Uh, this is something that we are uh, looking into uh, to do uh, for a future charging event. The thing is that because L1 chargers connect to a normal wall socket, they are not the big threat. Uh, or opportunity in this case. So because they, they connect to you know it's a uh, a wall socket within your within your home, uh, you know it would almost be like if you bought a giant vacuum cleaner. We still you know because our system is designed to allow you to use every socket within your home at full capacity, you're okay. The the real problem comes when people install level two chargers because those function at 240 uh, volts 
AC, which is basically what your stove functions on. So, you know, we do expect people, you know, that the odd customer might want to run everything in their home, but we really do not expect too many people to have more than one stove in their home. So that's where actually I think the, the trouble is. So although level one charging is an issue, I think it's a minor one compared to level two adoption. Thanks, Yuvo. So the next question I think you may have just answered, but I'll pose it anyways. There might be some new information. Uh, what kind of strain is put on the electricity distribution system when several L1 chargers are present uh, and active within the same area, i.e. street or block? Uh, quite a bit. In fact, uh, we can tell you if you have an electric, we can tell if you have an electric vehicle or not. Because uh, we can look at your load from you know the month before or the year before, and uh, your load right now, and we can automatically tell. So it doesn't even take a human being. We have a program on our side, which will go through all of your data and tell us that you know I think this guy is electric vehicle, and that's how much of a strain it puts. That it's noticeable in a kind of an algorithm. So you know we see that at six o'clock suddenly there is a peak, and this peak is higher than the normal peak. And uh, you know the inference is that you have an electric vehicle. And so far, when we have done this, uh, when we have run this program, I think we're at like 90 something percent uh, on on whether we see the electric vehicle or not. Like whether we, we you know, if it's a if it's a, a true positive or not. Um, from in terms of absolute numbers, uh, Farstream's territory is actually fairly new. So you know, you know, we service. Uh, the outskirts of Toronto, which are not yet fully um, urbanized and not fully developed. So we do have a lot of capacity. So in right now, we are not seeing, you know, pure overloads as it were. But we can see that it will overload faster than we expected to. So let's say we had made plans and said that, you know, at the current rate of growth, we will not see an overload for five years. Well, with EVs now coming in, we'll probably see this overload happening within two. Okay, thanks, Shivo. So two more questions here. Uh, the first is, what incentives are there for electricity distribution companies like PowerStream to partake in the installation of L3 chargers along 400 series of highways and other areas to promote interprovincial EV travel? Right now, I'm not aware that there are any incentives like that. Uh, a lot of incentives in Ontario, I think, concentrate more on like the R&D side. Uh, Level one, level two, and level three chargers are not R and D. They are here. They are, you know, fully uh, developed product. So right now, I, I'm not aware of any. And if any of you are aware of some, please let me know because I want to answer. Thank you. Thanks, Shivo. And last one: any potential increase in premature deg degradation of batteries when fast chargers are employed? Uh, this is actually a concern that a lot of the electric vehicle companies had when they first uh, came out with level three charging. Uh, in a word, I would say no. There, there isn't really that much of a concern. Um, the thing is that uh, as I as I went through my presentation, uh, I think there's a slide four or five. Uh, the the difference between level between DC charging and level one, level two charging is the fact that instead of going through the machinery within the uh, car to convert the electricity from AC to DC, you are offloading that piece of machinery. So, you know, maybe you could have a six kilowatt uh, converter in your vehicle. Well, we can put a 50 kilowatt converter outside your vehicle and charge the battery directly. So, it's not really that you're pushing more power uh, uh, through systems that are not originally designed for that. What you're doing is pushing power directly into the battery. And the batteries actually have a very high capacity to, to absorb power. So, uh, yeah, uh, the qu answer to the question is no. There is no there's no noticeable or significant degradation in, in battery life. Okay, great. Thank you, Shivo. So I'm going to uh, pass the controls over to Jennifer Wong now with the city of Markham. And uh, Jennifer, when you're ready, please go ahead. All right, Jennifer, we can hear you. Okay, hello? Okay, great. All right, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you.
request and Samir for allowing me to speak about, um, I guess, a case study of City of Markham and why we've um, integrated electric vehicle and electric vehicle studies and EV chargers um, within our city and our mandate. And so uh, if you don't know me, I am the Sustainability Services Coordinator at the City of Markham. And um, I have mainly focus a lot on community energy, uh, mainly right now community energy plans. And I'll show you um, exactly how we've integrated EV um, charging stations and EV uh, electric vehicles in general into our community energy plan. So a quick agenda. Um, I'm going to take you really quickly over uh, over our green print community sustainability plan and um, how the objectives of the green print uh, aligns with our studies with EV and also community energy planning. Um, I'll go through, and I think it's already been mentioned in the other two presentations, but uh, quickly. Uh, the level three charging station at the Market Civic Center and uh, why we decide to do this and the partnerships behind that project. Um, and then later, uh, actually in 2014, we did a study with Pollution Probe um, called the Electric Mobility Adoption and Prediction Report, otherwise known as EMAP, and I'll uh, speak to that as well. And then uh, the Municipal Energy Plant integration with EVs and then lessons learned and next steps. Uh, so the Green Plan is our community sustainability plan. It has a vision of leading the way together to livable neighborhoods, healthy people, and continuing prosperity. Uh, there are three pillars to the Green Plan, environmental health, social and cultural well-being, and economic vitality. And um, below that, there are 12 priorities, and I'll be focusing on the energy and climate priority with the objective of net zero energy, water, waste, and emissions by 2050. Uh, so moving into uh, the level three charging station that we've incorporated into the Markham Civic Center, uh, we partnered with PowerStream, Nissan Canada, Ad Energy slash Burn Network to um, incorporate this the implementation of the charging station. Um, and as mentioned before, there was um, the cost of the actual project was divided into thirds. So Markham would take one third, PowerStream, and then Nissan Canada. And um, for Markham itself, we funded it through uh, the revenues that we've received from our uh, solar rooftop projects that are on our community centers and corporate buildings. Um, we also have something called the FIT revenue um, that we charge a, revenue, or a fee to uh, external applicants who are looking to seek FIT uh, application or priority points uh, from the municipality. Uh, we've used that towards this project as well. And then also um, any type of revenue that we receive from energy savings uh, that we've incorporated into city buildings, we've also used that towards uh, this type of funding. And so once we uh, start to receive revenue from uh, the EV charging station uh, uses, it will go back to this uh, funding source so that it creates a self-sustaining fund. Um, so Markham installed uh, its first level three charger um, at the Market Civic Center because we saw this as a great pilot project with uh, our partners, but also to become a leader in uh, level three charging as it is a little bit more rare now and uh, mainly there are level twos around uh, the city uh, and around the GTA. Um, of course, it, we saw this uh, as great alignment with uh, a project that the city was already doing, um, which was the parking lot retrofit. So we've actually installed LED lighting in our, um, in our parking lot and also uh, repaved uh, the pavement. And so incorporating the level three charger implementation, we saw this as a win-win, created synergies and um, eventually it actually saved the city money as well. Um, it, was it was made available um, in July, so late, earlier this month for public use. And right now it is free of charge. Um, anyone who has an ad energy uh, card, which you can obtain online or even through CAA, you can actually come to the Civic Center and uh, receive free charges for uh, your electric vehicle. And as mentioned, it takes about 30 minutes for a 75 to 80 percent charge uh, for the vehicle itself. And um, we plan to launch officially uh, the EV charger by fall 2015, and that's when um, we will actually put in a cost to charging your vehicle, and the cost would be about $5 per half hour, which we thought was a really great um, 
benefit to the community and uh, create a little bit of revenue for us as well, uh, the partners. Um, there are other publicly available uh, EV chargers within Markham, uh, such as the GO station at Centennial, uh, near Centennial Community Center. Uh, and then there are a couple of other ones as well uh, within the community, uh, especially at uh, car dealerships, which we've seen as a huge trend. And then, um, of course, the level three is the first one that the municipality has actually implemented. And then uh, some external resources, um, I've included our plug share and the CAA EV charging station locator. These are great resources to kind of see uh, exactly where EV uh, chargers are within the GTA. So not just Markham, but anywhere in the GTA and you know, even in the states as well for plug share. Um, it's almost like a wiki. So uh, customers or you know, the community um, can actually input any type of information um, about EV chargers uh, within each city that they have come across. Okay, so this kind of shows um, exactly where the EV uh, charging station is located. So the Civic Center, actually, Civic Center is about right here. And the reason why we chose this spot was because um, there were a lot of amenities uh, nearby. So if you see uh, in this side here is a, uh, it's called Markham Town Square. So it's um, a local retailer. It has supermarkets, banks, um, Shopper Strong Mart, and restaurants there that. Uh, people who want to leave their car charging can walk over and actually uh, spend some time there while they wait for their car to charge. And then uh, below there, we also have the Hilton um, Hotel right here, and then a few other restaurants here as well. And um, when we were choosing the, the location, there were two locations that we've considered. So Morgan Civic Center, which we've uh, obviously built the charging station at, and then also uh, 8100 Warden which is our second set of offices. It's a little bit uh, south of Warden, or sorry, uh, of Highway 7. And um, it was it's closer to the 407, so that's why it was also a contender. But we decided to choose the Civic Center because of the local amenities that are around. And uh, the Civic Center also offers free Wi-Fi. And there's also um, a little bit of entertainment with our Markham Theater right here as well. Okay, so moving into uh, the EMAP study that we did in 2014. This was in partnership with PowerStream, um, the City of Vaughan, Town of Richmond Hill, and then of course Markham. Um, it really studied PowerStream service territories in York Region on the uptake of EVs, early adopters, using market research, and um, grid integration, infrastructure, and impact analysis onto the grid um, to understand where the best possibilities of EV charging station infrastructure should go within um, your region. And so through the study, it identified um, who our local or uh, our communities are of early adopters for uh, EVs. Um, it looked into who had EVs, not, not specifically, but um, exactly where they were uh, located within the areas of the city. And then um, at the end, uh, it really built a business case as to why this study was, uh, was important to us and why EV integration uh, would be beneficial to the city and to PowerStream and, uh, of course, as a partner um, within that study too. And so underneath, I've actually incorporated a link to the EMAP webpage. So you'll see a few of the other studies, I believe Toronto, London, and um, I'm not sure, there was another one um, on the website, including uh, Markham, Vaughan, and Richmond Hill, and you can see all the different studies there and um, the thought process behind it with Pollution Pro. Okay, so integration in the Municipal Energy Plan, or otherwise known as uh, the Community Energy Plan. Um, we recently released our RFP out uh, for um, a consultant to join us to complete the municipal energy plan by December 2016. And in that bid document, we've included um, as a provisional item a citywide electric vehicle study, which will look at EV ownership, um, exactly how many EVs are within the city, who owns them, where, where are they located, uh, forecasting of GHG emissions reductions um, with the vehicles that 
are already owned and the possibilities of them increasing within the city, what are the reductions of GHGs from that? Um, charge, strategically charging station siting citywide, so understanding, um, and it kind of flows back to that EMAP study, and uh, both studies would be integrated within the MEP, but really understanding where in the city um, would be the best locations to site a level two or level three or uh, charging stations uh, publicly so that can, uh, customers or community can use it. Um, we also hope to do a lot of consultation and workshops with our key stakeholders, uh, businesses, our local utility providers to understand um, their uptake on, um, on EV charging stations and how we can educate and engage more of our stakeholders to uptake this type of infrastructure. And then um, through that study, we'll also have a, communi a communication and engagement plan that will be integrated back into the municipal energy plan. And that also has a communication and engagement plan um, to understand uh, exactly who our target market is, um, how do we streamline our education and, and engagement to these different sectors within the city, and um, just increase this type of infrastructure within the city on a from a 2050 period. And from that study, we uh, definitely want recommendations on short, medium, and long-term targets and actions to be, again, integrated into the MEP so that it's flow smoothing and that uh, when we are ready to integrate more EV charging stations, um, we would have those recommendations handy um, to hit these targets. And um, this will also help to reduce, uh, of course, the emission load uh, within the city and reach our energy um, or net zero by 2050 climate objective. So some lessons learned uh, through this, uh, Mark, the Markham Civic Center Level 3 charging uh, pilot program that we did was that uh, um, ensure, you know, if you are doing this, um, especially for the municipalities, if you are considering something like a Level 3 or even Level 2 uh, charging station, uh, really consider detailed engineering, power, and network mm -hmm. connectivity. Um, I think that was something that we really uh, learned a lot from. There was a, a little bit of a delay in the project just because some of the details weren't um, scoped out as well as we thought it could have been. And um, the project actually just took three months to complete. It was a little bit of rush just because we want to align the timelines with the retrofit of the parking lot uh, better. And so, uh, you know, if we were to do this back in, or if we were to do this in the future, we would definitely spend a lot more time on that detailed uh, work. Um, ensure long-term product support and warranty. So we do anticipate a four to five year payback on uh, the infrastructure um, versus the revenue that we will receive from uh, the charging from the level three. And so we did want to ensure that we had the warranty available within that five year period in case, you know, if something were to go wrong or um, if something major had to be fixed, we would be covered and that we wouldn't lose out on that payback period. Um, and then something that we've, uh, and we're continuing to learn uh, and that we've learned is that social media marketing, um, has been great for us to market this level three charging station. Um, it's actually increased the word of mouth within that EV community. And uh, we've seen a lot of uh, just impact from that community on, on the, the integration of the level three charging. And so we've actually gotten a lot of questions from the community, from our partners on, you know, how, how this is going, when will this be up, when we didn't uh, officially launch it in July for, uh, the, for, publicly, uh, for public use, but, um, you know, use, use the community as your friend. I mean, I think having that word of mouth uh, benefit uh, has really helped us with promoting this EV uh, charging station. And then our next steps is, of course, to continue with the citywide EV study uh, through the MEP uh, in, uh, integration and initiative. And then on the bottom, I've also included our City of Markham webpage, which provides a little bit more information on the EV charging station um, at the Civic Center and um, rebates and programs and, of course, external resources. And that's it.
if anyone has any questions. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks. That was uh, a great, uh, really well-rounded presentation. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one here is, uh, so this person asks, is saying, I'd be interested in learning how much you uh, charge per fit application to generate revenue. Sure. Um, I, we do have a document that outlines exactly uh, the process and the thought process behind the fee as well. It actually aligns to our uh, our planning department minor site plan fee. So uh, I can definitely share that with you. Great, thanks. And we'll make that available in the uh, follow-up email then. Um, so I have a question for you, Jen. Of, uh, of all the uh, GHG reduction strategies that the City of Markham is implementing, um, how much do you think the EV strategy is going to contribute to total reduction of uh, GHGs, if you're ready to, to answer that question? Um, I don't think we're ready to answer that. Um, sure. it, this is still fairly new for us. I mean, I think once we have that EV study completed uh, in throughout the municipal energy plan process, we'll have a better idea as to the GSU reductions um, as EV uh, vehicles do increase over time as well. Great, so uh, any other questions for Jennifer? Well, I'll just give you a minute to uh, type your question into the chat. If we don't hear any, Jen, I think that's indicative of a, of a great presentation. So thanks very much. Thank you. OK, so uh, hearing none, um, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. That kind of brings us to the end of our presentations. Uh, just a quick recap. So we heard early on that EVs have the potential to greatly reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And therefore, this is a timely conversation considering all the recent political activity at the provincial level around climate change mitigation and adaptation. From a municipal perspective, EVs can contribute to GHG reduction targets and be integrated into a community energy plan. And we also heard from Jen that this is a local economic development opportunity. And from a utility perspective, it's, uh, we're seeing that this is a business development and differentiation opportunity. Um, we heard a lot about the importance of partnerships and leadership, educating consumers, as well as making it as easy as possible for consumers to buy, use, and charge their EVs. And I think that we saw that PowerStream and Markham are both good examples of leadership in this area. So thanks once again to our speakers, Josh, Shuvo, and Jen. And I encourage you to contact them with any additional questions. Um, as mentioned, this is only the second of a five-part series, so please go to questcanada.org slash Ontario under New with Quest Ontario for more information. The next webinar is going to be August 12th, where we'll be looking at waste as an energy opportunity. Um, and also, please remember to take a look at Quest 2015, Getting Smart About Energy in Our Communities, uh, by going to our website. And while you're there, take advantage of our summertime discount on registration. So thanks again, everyone, and we'll talk to you soon.